in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite the kids to go to the His Kids. We've been uh, kind of camped out in the first 14 verses of Ephesians uh, so far this year, and we've got one more week to go uh, with, with Kara here next week. And I know we've read the, wor- the, the words a number of times. I'm going to read them once more in a, in a few moments. And, and, and it might seem like, okay, we've heard them before, but you know, to read them again reinforces things we've already heard, but it also opens the door to perhaps hearing something that we've missed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you as I, as I read through these, uh, these verses once more to maybe just this time just close your eyes, listen, open your uh, heart, your mind to what God might have for you, uh, and this, just trust the Spirit to, uh, to speak to you as I read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Lord, Lord, speak to us through these words so that, Lord, you will continue to work your purposes out for us individually and, Lord, for us as a church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For some unknown reason, I got thinking about liturgical dance earlier this week. Um, and uh, Jake talked about doing line dancing up here. So, you know, Jake, anytime you're ready, you know. <laughs> when I hear line dancing, I think of, yeah, all kinds of things. But anyway, uh, for some reason, I got thinking about liturgical dance. And, I, and I'll be honest, I've never been a, a, a huge proponent of it. That is dance that's done as part of a worship service. Now, I'm not against it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It just doesn't do a lot for my worship experience. I remember, though, retired covenant missionary Jim Gustafson, who used to tell about a lady in Thailand who, when he visited her, or she was visiting him, I don't remember kind of what the direction was, uh, that, that she couldn't stop dancing. And the dancing that she did was, was uh, something like a, a ballet. And, and Jim tried to get her to stop, but she wouldn't. And the reason is that she was so overjoyed that that Jim had brought her the gospel, that she had come to know Jesus Christ, and she was so overjoyed, and the best way that she had to express it was through dance. And she was, the pictures, we made her look like she was maybe about 130 years old. 
So I'm not quite sure how she did it, but, but she did it, and it was, it was a beautiful thing. Dancing in worship probably seems strange to a lot of us, and I, I get that. But in Exodus 15, Moses' sister Miriam and a number of the other uh, women, this is not, Moses, this is not Miriam and, and the Israelites, by the way, uh, Moses' sister Miriam and some other women celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt by dancing. And you may recall that as the Ark of the Covenant was being carried into Jerusalem, David danced before the Lord, 2 Samuel 6. And Psalm 149, part of which Rommel read for us at the beginning of the service, tells us to praise God with dancing. Verse 3, let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. And it's salvation that we come to this morning as we continue to address the question, why love God at all? In Ephesians 1.13, Paul writes this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We've seen that followers of Jesus are chosen, they're adopted, they're accepted, and now today they are saved. But what does that mean? What's the significance of it? What does it suggest? Well, let me, let me say that I think it suggests several things. We're only going to touch on, on a few this morning, but it, it starts with the notion that we were actually in real danger. Being saved suggests that we were in real danger. We don't need to be saved if we're not at risk, right? You don't need a Savior if there's not something wrong. The other morning I was uh, watching the, the early morning news in one of the local stations and the reporters were reminding people again about the dangers of going out on the ice. Now, several people, as you know, have already died this year because they had gone out on the ice. It wasn't able to support them. They fell through and, and that was it. Happens every year. No matter how many times people hear the warnings or see the signs saying, keep off the ice, they go on the ice, they fall through, and even if they don't die, a lot of times they come pretty close to it. There are good reasons for the warnings and for the signs. In Ephesians 1, 13, Paul calls the gospel the word of truth. Tim Keller reminds us that there are, are two parts to that truth. The one, of course, is grace. And, and Ephesians 1, like all of Paul's writing, is full of grace. He hits that theme again and again and again. But there's another part to that truth, and it's the reason that we need grace. It's the first part. It's the part without which grace doesn't matter. The first part of the gospel truth concerns sin, that nasty, heartless, cruel reality that corrupts and kills everything and everyone, and it has been doing that ever since Adam and Eve ignored God's warning to them. Because they ignored that warming, warning, there, there was this, there's been this domino effect. And the dominoes continue to fall. And everything that, from sin and everything that goes with it has been passed down to us. And apart from faith in Jesus Christ, and this is a, this is a, a point that even believers in, in Jesus are increasingly confused on, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, we are in real danger more than we probably even realize. I said last week that God does in fact discipline us. He does in fact voice his, his displeasure at times, but that does not mean that he doesn't love us. 
There are warnings in Scripture, including the warnings that go along with rejecting Jesus of not following. There are warnings in Scripture that are kind of like those keep off the ice signs. They are meant to keep us safe. They are meant to keep us alive, to keep us away from danger, the very real danger that every one of us, every one of us is prone to. And as more than one person has said one way or another, the moment that we think that we are immune, the moment we think it can't be us, we have become the most vulnerable people in the world. Apart from faith in Jesus Christ, we are lost. We are doomed. And we have been in real danger. There's a second thing being saved suggests. And this is probably uh, something that, that we think about maybe more often, and that is that we are free from some things. Verses 7 and 14, uh, Paul speaks of redemption. That is just one of many ideas in the Scripture that is connected with this idea of, uh, with, with, with being saved or the idea of salvation. Redemption. What does it mean to redeem something? Anyone have a... Anyone ever pawned something or know of someone who has pawned something? You turn something over to someone else, they hold it to get it back to redeem it, then you have to pay them a certain amount of money. To redeem something means to free it, means to buy it back. For instance, if someone, uh, if someone sells a piece, someone, in the Old Testament, if someone sold a piece of property, maybe they sold it because they needed the money, they were poor, they were destitute, they, so they sold something to someone else. Leviticus says that the person should be able to buy it back. They should be able to redeem it. It is, in a sense, their property, they, and they can get it back. For a Hebrew who perhaps sold himself into slavery, again, probably because he needed money for something, he needed to pay a debt, that person could be redeemed by someone else who was willing to pay off the debt. Redemption is basically about being released, about being brought back, about being freed from something, especially when it comes to to people. Think back to Moses and and Miriam and and Miriam and the other women who were dancing in Exodus 15. What were they celebrating? They They were celebrating the fact that God had freed them from slavery, that they had been redeemed, that they had been saved. But remember... We have a much greater salvation than, than, than Israel ever had. We have a lot more to dance about, a lot more to sing about than, than, than Israel ever did, than, than Miriam ever did. Think back to the thing that endangers us and endangers everyone else, the, the issue of sin, everything that goes with it. In the New Testament, that freedom from sin, that being redeemed from sin, released from it, and all its effects up to and including eternal condemnation, That is central to the work of Jesus. It is central to the message of salvation. It is central to the gospel. That is the heart and soul of Christianity. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that's not where things end. It goes on, verse 24, And are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by God. Christ Jesus. We have been in real danger. If we have come to follow Jesus, we have been saved from some things. The, the theological word that's often used is the word justification. It's another theme that you do find in Paul's writing. And, and, and the definition of justification that I learned in seventh grade Bible class at Minneapolis Academy with Gladys Freiland, justification is just as if I'd never sinned. And we, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, he looks at us no matter what it is that we've done, and he sees us as just as if we've never sinned. We have been freed. We have been freed. But there's another side to it. John 3.16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only 
Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Not perishing, that's the freedom from, but it's the term eternal life that I want to focus on for a moment. Not only are we freed from some things, we are freed for other things. If you're like me and you hear the word eternal life, you think of life that just goes on without end. In fact, the song that we sang earlier uses it that way. It's kind of what Paul alludes to later in verse 14 when he speaks about this, when he, when he alludes to the second coming of Christ and, and the unending future life in his presence. That is certainly part of it. But that's not all of it. Eternal life doesn't necessarily refer just to life that doesn't end sometime in the future. It, refer, it refers, can refer to a present life that is shaped by eternity, or maybe we should say shaped by the eternal one. And who is the eternal one? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's another word that goes with justification. You probably heard it. It's the word sanctification. Sanctification has to do with this idea of, of having a life now that's shaped by the eternal. Sanctification is about the ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We are saved from sin and death. We are saved for eternal life, including a present life shaped by the one who is eternal. Ephesians 4.24, which we'll come to uh, later on, Paul calls it the new self. The self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Think back to a few weeks ago when we, we touched on verse 4 where Paul writes about being chosen to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's not just a uh, a, a legal reality. It's an ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus. And when we come back to Ephesians after Easter, we're going to dig into some of the ways that, that that lives itself out. I say it because quite often, at least for me over the years, I think of being saved as being saved from something. But when it comes to salvation, we, it is just as important that, that we recognize that we have been saved for other things. We have been saved for a different kind of life. And that's why Ephesians 4.1, which is, is in my mind the key verse in the whole book, that's why Ephesians 4.1 tells us to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. Live into the life you have been chosen for. Live into the life you have been adopted into and that you have been saved for. One more thing that being saved suggests, that we are now safe and secure. In fact, the first song that we sang, or yeah, I think it was the first song we sang, had, hints, had more than hints of that. When I hit save on my computer, what am I doing? What am I doing when I hit save on my computer? Why would I hit save on my computer? To preserve it, to preserve something, to keep that document, to make sure that it's there when I come back to it, that it's not corrupted, that it's not missing. Verse 14, which Kara will look at next week, Paul calls the Holy Spirit a guarantee of our inheritance to come. In other words, part of living this new life in Christ, part of being saved is, is that we are secure, that we, that, that we are being preserved for the future. There's another dimension to this besides justification, sanctification is glorification. Justification is what's already been accomplished. Sanctification is what God is doing here and now in our lives every day as we become more like Jesus. 
glorification. That's the last step. And what's, what Jude writes about when he, when he talks about being presented before God's glorious presence without fault. Not quite sure how good an illustration this is. And of course, every analogy breaks down at some point. But anyone ever restored an old car or know someone who has? Okay, John has. Dave has. I see a few hands, people who have restored a, a, an old car. Or I guess it could be something else. It could be an old motorcycle or, or something else. What's the process? Let's assume that you bought the car from someone else. So you, in a sense, you redeemed the car. And if not just from being owned by someone else, maybe from it going to the junkyard and being crushed into a little tiny you know, square. You've redeemed the car. But then there's this long, expensive, arduous process of tearing it apart, fixing some parts of it, replacing others, refurbishing the thing until it's finally put back together and ready to go. But when it is finished and put together and you roll it out of the shop or the garage, or wherever you've been working on it, it has a beauty that has been restored. A beauty that reflects what it was intended for in the first place. Think of that as a, the glorification. But along the way, there can be a lot of frustration, can't there? Something doesn't go right. There's a part missing that you have a hard time finding. There are setbacks, there are delays. I know some folks who have, who have done some restoration projects where they kind of get to the point where they're just ready to give up on the thing. God doesn't do that. He doesn't give up. He sticks with us to the end. He is going to see the project through if we let him. It's all part of him keeping us safe and secure, preserving us for that day when Jude says when we will be stand before his throne without fault. Last week we Spent a little bit of our time looking at the parable of the prodigal son. And of course, after the son left home, he got into deep trouble, eventually came to his senses, came crawling back to his, to his father. But when he came home, he really had no idea what to expect. In fact, what he really expected was that he was going to probably be treated no better than a hired, than a hired man. But when he got home, what happened? He was welcomed by his father. And he was, he was given the best that his father could give him in celebration. For followers of, in, in, in other words, he was back home, he was safe, he was secure, he was where he belonged. And for followers of Jesus... There is that safe place in God's arms, just like there was the safe place in the Father's arms in that parable. We may go through rough times. We may go through frustrating times. But in the end, we are safe and secure, and God will walk with us to the end. And the end will be glorious. When it comes to this question of why love God at all, there are many more reasons besides the few that we're, that we're looking at. But all of them and so many others are only real, they are only possible, again, because of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I think of all the reasons that we have to love God, not just these few, but, but so many others, I have to conclude that being in Christ, meaning being in relationship to Christ, being in Christ is the only place that any of us should want to be. 
This idea of being in Christ, the phrase in Christ occurs at least seven times in these first 14 verses of Ephesians, at least seven times. Starts in verse 1, where Paul says that he is writing to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. It's a relational statement. And the fact is that none of the rest of it is possible, and none of the rest of it probably even matters if we are not in relationship with him. In verse 13, Paul says, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. He goes on to say, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. been around as long as I have or maybe not even that long you probably have heard the question asked this is common among evangelicals for many years uh, the question asked are you saved interestingly enough our our early covenanters didn't tend to ask that question they tended to ask a different question and the question was are you living in Jesus and it's not because being saved wasn't important to him was vitally important to them, but they realized that that just that wasn't where it ended. It didn't end with our decision to follow Christ. It's kind of like the distinction between getting married and being married. You, you get married at a moment in time, but you are married every day. Getting married is an event. Being married is an ongoing relationship. You say, I do at your wedding, but then you live it every day. When we talked about having been chosen by God, we talked about the fact that God said yes to us before we ever said yes to him. And yet we do have to say yes to him. Donald Frisk wrote, all is of grace. But we also know that none of this would have happened had we not said yes to God. Such is the paradox of grace. Grace is God saying yes to us, and our response has to be yes to him. And so that early covenant question, are you living in Jesus? Not just have you made a decision to follow him, but are you living in him every day? How do you know? You have indeed chosen to follow Jesus. That's part of the answer. If you are pursuing that love relationship with him every day on a, a regular basis, that's part of your answer. If your deepest desire is, is that theme verse for our year, that the verse that's, that, that underlies the word love and go love live, if, If your deepest desire is, in fact, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's part of the answer. In a moment, we're going to share communion. As we do, as the servers come forward and we prepare the elements, I'm going to ask you to to do something, and I'm just going to ask you to think about this question quietly, put it before the Lord, whatever you want to do with it, think about that question. Are you living in Jesus? Are you living in him? Not just have you, have you decided to follow him, but are you living in him? And reflect on that as we prepare to share the Lord's Supper.